Jason Priam. Hey, y'all. Um, so yeah, I am Jason Priam. Uh, I have a couple of hats on today. Um, uh, one is as a PhD student, I uh, am a student in information science at UNC Chapel Hill. The other one is as a founder and co-PI of Total Impact, which is a web application that gathers a variety of different metrics about uh, social uh, scholarly content. It's kind of social media analytics for scholarship. Um, and I guess I'll sort of be talking with both hats on. Um, but yeah, so let's start off by saying exactly what publishers do, right? What are they good for? What do we need them for? Uh, there are four sort of... Oh, thank you. There are four sort of traditional functions of a journal, and these are, are based in literature from, the, I guess, the mid part of the 20th century. Um, we've got uh, certification, which is sort of the you know, peer review process traditionally. Uh, we've got dissemination, of course, which is traditionally printing things on paper and sending it to places. Uh, we've got archiving, which is making sure that it doesn't go away. And registration, which I think is really um, more or less a function of, of archiving, as long as you've got it stable somewhere, then later on if someone says, hey, you know, I came with that discovery before you did, I can say, oh, no, actually, I, I came with the first, right, and here's, here's the proof uh, in this journal. So those are the traditional functions. Um, I think somewhat concerningly for publishers, uh, those functions are sort of going away. Um, the question that we need to be asking is not what do publishers do, because I think we all know that in this room. They do a good job of it, and they get paid quite well for it. The question is, what will you do? <laughs> Thank you. That's inappropriate. So it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable ask. I, I'll say a lot of people make a living off of it. Maybe that would make people, not everyone, but a lot of people make a living off of it, certainly compared to, uh, let's say, the publishing ecosystem in... 1601, right, which, in which it didn't exist. So we live in a world in which people do make money off of publishing. But I think the real question, the important question, is not what publishers do do, it's what they will do in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. That's why we're in this room. That's why we're asking this question at all. I don't think many people were asking this question in, let's say, 1972, right? I mean, people understand that this is a, a realm of endeavor which is changing in really, in really big ways. So archiving and registration, for instance, a lot of these uh, can be taken care of online. If there's an online copy of, a, of an article, we have things like institutional repositories, which are committed to long-term preservation. We have uh, LOCKS, which is sort of a consortium, you know, a bunch of different a way of, of letting libraries uh, store things sort of uh, in multiple locations so that electronic copies of articles can persist. In fact, a lot of people are, are a lot of journals uh, a lot of libraries print out paper copies of their journals because paper has proven to be sort of a long-term archiving strategy that's, that's uh, shown itself to work. Um, dissemination, as Clay Shirky has said, right, is no longer a business, it's a button, right? If I want to publish something, I'll do it for it. Like, I mean, I published a tweet 15 seconds ago. I'm not saying it was good, but the idea of publishing, right, of making something public is very much a solved problem. That's not something that we really need publishers or anybody else for now. Um, certification is something that, that is still super important. And typically when we have these discussions, uh, we move to the certification question quite quickly. We say, well, someone needs to make sure, as David pointed out, someone needs to make sure that this work is good, right? And I mean, it's easy to publish, but it's not easy to find good work that has been published. So let's think about the certification function. Our journal's still necessary, our publisher's still necessary for that. Well, we can think of two ways of doing the certification. We think of the explicit ranking, which we can think of as sort of peer review. You find some expert and you say, hey guys, is this good? And if it's good, then it gets published. If not, it isn't. Um, and I think we can compare this to, in web terms, early Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo, you know, they, they hired experts and they said, experts, go out onto this crazy thing called the World Wide Web. Find the sites that are good. Because a lot of them aren't good. And, and are, you know, people who search, they want the good ones. So Yahoo did this. A lot of librarians actually did this in the early days of the web. They, they came up with these catalogs of the good websites. Of course, those don't exist anymore, right? They couldn't scale at the same rate that the web was scaling because they were too labor intensive. So the internet has increasingly moved to uh, implicit ranking, like what Google does. Google doesn't have any experts ranking websites. Instead, they just listen to what people on the web say about websites. And the way they say it is with hyperlinks. So a, a site that's got a lot of hyperlinks from pages that themselves have many hyperlinks tends to be a highly ranked uh, web page in Google results. They're using implicit feedback. They're using feedback that comes from the discussions and the conversations and the rankings that are being made by the community. There's a great, uh, you know, great predecessor to this is, of course, the Citation Network, which uh, you know, the NSF is very quick to tell you, uh, you know, Sergey Brin was working on when he came up with the algorithm for Google. 
Um, the citation network in the scholarly literature predates the web. It's a web of citations, a web of ideas that shows which things have been influential. That's a good example of implicit feedback. Implicit feedback has not been super effective for scholarly communication simply because it takes a very long time to accumulate. The citation latency can be as much as two years, and by that time, everyone sort of moved on. Um, but the idea of not asking experts, but listening to experts, is potentially a very powerful way of ranking. And if we're asking what publishers will be doing in the next couple years, in the next decade for sure, we have to say, are they going to be doing explicit ranking? I think likely not, because we've seen that scales very badly. Will they be doing implicit ranking? Well, I'm not sure if publishers will, but I think somebody will. As I said, I'm a co-PI on this thing called Total Impact, and there's an example of it there. Um, Total Impact has uh, recently got a $100,000 grant from Sloan Foundation's uh, scholarly uh, Publishers have expressed a lot of interest in this, and, and funders have expressed a lot of interest in this, because they want to see the wider impact of what they fund. So here we can see, uh, it's a bit hard to, to see from the back there, I apologize, but you know, we can see one article, and we can see all of the metrics we've accumulated for that article. We can see readership, the number of times people put it in a Mendeley library, the number of times it's been cited on Wikipedia. Uh, you can't see this off the screen, but the number of times it's been blogged, the number of times it's been tweeted. We can aggregate the conversations around these items. We can look at the the implicit, not screwed up, implicit feedback um, that is that experts are having these conversations with. There's other uh, sites that do this as well. So there's altmetric.com. Ewan Aidy uh, is the founder of that, and he's here, and I encourage you to talk to him. He's a smart guy. Science Card, uh, Public Library of Science, has been using article-level metrics uh, with some success for a couple of years now. So this is not just, you know, it's not a one-off, not my crazy idea. A number of people are trying to say, let's gather this implicit feedback. So. What's the value of this? Why, why should we care about implicit feedback? Well, we can get a lot of metadata that way. So uh, this is from a study that I did with my PhD hat on and um, with my hopefully someday having a PhD hat on. Uh, and you can see these are the tags that authors gave. There's just two. And then here are the tags we can get from Delicious and Site Like, which are two social bookmarking sites. There's a lot more metadata available if we listen to the crowd, if we listen to what experts are saying instead of asking experts. Because again, as David points out, scientists don't have a lot of time, right? It's hard to get scientists to peer review because they're trying to do science, not trying to peer review. However, if you listen to the conversations scientists are already having, there's a lot more data there. This is an example of timelines for one particular article. So at the top, we see delicious bookmarks. As soon as the article was published on day zero, it accumulated a lot of bookmarks right away. Um, it also accumulated a comment and a site-like bookmark, and then kind of not a lot of action. Then at the bottom we see crossref, uh, crossref citation, and right around the time that that crossref citation happened, uh, we got a lot of tweets, and I'm guessing that's from people who saw the citation in, in an article that was published and then tweeted it. And then presumably a bunch of people saw those tweets, and quite soon after they were bookmarking it on site like, and then there was a comment. And we can see how waves of interest about an object move through the scholarly community. Now this is a very gross and sort of naive way of looking at this because we don't know who these tweets come from, who the site like bookmarks come from. But that information is there. I mean, these, these have metadata that show what the username is. So what we could potentially do is move beyond just counting and actually say for a particular person's network, who that you know, that you trust, is talking about this particular scholarly item and what they care about. So why am I, why am I getting into all this stuff? The reason I'm getting all this stuff is because there's one big question that this supports. If you could get daily reading recommendations based on the aggregated judgments of your trusted network, would you read journals anymore? I think for many of us the answer is no. If I could every day see what the people that I care about, that I trust, the experts in my field, what they're talking about and what they think about scholarly objects, I don't see any particular reason to get the assessment of two anonymous experts selected by an editor that I don't know. I would rather get the opinion of the experts that I know and that I trust. And I think that we're very quickly moving towards a world where that's going to happen. I think we're moving towards a world of a decoupled journal, a post-journal world, where instead of we have individual silos full of one organization sort of taking on all these responsibilities, we split up the four functions and we have uh, sort of individual uh, contractors or individual external services providing the different functions. And as an author, I can choose what I want. So this base level, we have identity and, and storage, which are relatively trivial. Um, you know, we have the DOI system, we have uh, institutional repositories and things like that. And then I can decide, hey, I, I don't want to, as Davis said, I don't want to spend time preparing my manuscript. I'm not a very good speller. I don't know about semicolons. I'm going to send, some, send that out to someone who can do it. I mean, journals are already, already contract most of this out already. Why, why, don't, why don't individuals do it, right? Um, I, I, I want my work to be very findable, right? So I'm going to 
uh, subscribe to, someone who makes sure my work is findable, someone who takes care of maybe some of the marking for me, someone who helps me uh, get found by search engines. And finally, I need assessment. I maybe need stamping or something like that. So I could, I could contract out to peer review uh, uh, services, right? I could say, hey, give me a peer review. Or give me a light peer review. Give me something really easy, like what PLOS One gives, right? They give a very rapid peer review that just looks at the, uh, at the, qual at the um, integrity of the research, right? Or I could say, just give me the metrics. Just give me um, the number of people and what people have tweeted this. If it's been tweeted by a Fields medalist, I want that on the paper. Right? Just you supply that for me. That's all the assessment that I'm going to need. But the authors would get to choose. I think we're moving already. We can see, you know, you go to the, to the room with the vendors in it, we see a lot of people who are contracting out stuff that used to be the job of journals. I think we're going to see that trend continue. So what comes after publishing? What, what is it if, if publishers are not going to be making journals, what kind of things can they do? And I think that there's a lot of things. I think in this fragmented and decoupled world that we're heading towards, there are a lot of things that publishers can do to make money. I don't think it'll be publishing. I don't think it'll be, it'll be managing all the four functions themselves. But I think that they have this opportunity. So I'm not going to read them all. But um, curating, text mining, marketing, um, recommendation, of course, I think is, is tremendously valuable. There's all of these tasks, some of which publishers sort of do now, some of which they don't do now. Um, but there's, it's a definitely different skill set. There's no question about that. And I think if I'm a publisher, I'm thinking, well, gosh, I'm really good at what I do, and it's kind of irritating to have to learn another skill set. And I, I definitely can sympathize with that. But at the same time, if I'm a sail maker in the age of steam, I have to start thinking about what I'm going to do to make a living. Because even though the sail industry is going to continue for some time, it's not the, it's not the industry of the future. And so I think as publishers, my question to you is not, you know, can publishers make a living doing what they do? Uh, is, pub is what publishers do important right now? Because the answer to both those questions is clearly yes. The question I want to ask you is, do you want to be in a growth market? Do you want to be in the market of the future? Or do you want to be hanging on to the market of the past as it slowly disappears? Um, so I, I don't want to be too down on publishers. That's not my point at all. Right? I come, come not to, to bury publishers, but to praise them. I think publishers do important work. But I think publishers are certainly going to have to change at a very fundamental level what they do because the age of the web has really changed the way people read, disseminate, and understand the literature. Uh, so like I said, welcome to Fight Club. Um, for those of you standing at the back, we do have some seats down here and over there if you want to come in and, and take a moment. I've got another question to ask. Tom, uh, has your slide deck changed since you gave it to me? It has changed, right, okay. Uh, once again, talk amongst yourselves. We'll just uh, clear this one out. Okay, yeah, go ask Jason a question. Since we have a minute, I wanted, I wanted to ask Jason a quick question. Well, um, Two quick things, sort of one, um, I, I'm not sure conversation is the right word. In particular, there's medical research, life sciences research, chemical research. There's a huge amount of money involved. Uh, there are patents, there are products to be made. Um, there are, there's tremendous competition for grants and things like that. So uh, a lot of the time, this, this conversations that are had are very private and not measurable. Um, you know, you, you cite your altmetrics paper, but that's really a community that's very active online and that shares a lot of information. Um, you know, if I'm competing against some other lab to create a cancer drug, I am not going to go online and talk about what I'm doing. So can this, can this um, system work in terms of a community that, that necessarily has secrecy as part of, uh, of, of how it works? Um, and then, you know, and the scale is also a, a big question. Um, you know, if you look at comments and reviews on papers almost not you know very a time get tweeted or get a comment or a review and every scientist I've ever spoken to says I will not even look at a paper that has not been peer-reviewed so th there's a huge mountain to scale of getting that first review on anything unless you have again that sort of neutral third party who says all right I'm gonna provide that uh, peer review service um, but it's, it's quite a long question, so I'll, I'll try and break it down into bits. Um, it's a good question, but uh, so I guess I would I would say first of all I don't think that it's required that things in in creation be discussed. I think what's required is as we have now things that have been published be discussed. Um, I'd like to see a world in which there are fewer secret labs because I think curing cancer is more important than keeping secrets, but that's a different different topic. I mean, and it is what it is, right? But I think we can absolutely have discussions about public published work and conversations perhaps that 
trivializing term, but whatever we call it, when things get published and I read something, I talk about it with my colleagues. And cancer research, I think, are no different. They discuss it with their colleagues and they say, this is good research, I want to, I want to continue along this strand, or they say, this is bad research and here's why. I think that that discussion currently uh, disappears into ether most of the time, right? It's conversations. But I think increasingly, if we think about what the future is going to look like, is that those conversations are going to be happening online. When I walk through the halls here, I, I think it's really interesting. I see a lot of people walking like this. Right? I mean, they're, they're, living, they're living in an online world increasingly, and I think researchers are going to be no different. They're going to be having these discussions in the online world, and what's, uh, what's interesting and useful about that is we can track those conversations. And so I think, or discussions, or how, how we want to call them. So I think that's part of an answer to the first part of the question. I think your point about researchers don't want to touch something unless it's peer-reviewed, I think is mm, certainly partly true, but I think this in some ways a sim simplification. I think a lot of researchers want to read anything that their closest competitor writes before it's been peer-reviewed or not, because they know it's good, they know it's important. Now, I don't want to read some just random article that someone has written, of course not. But if it's from someone that I care about, I'm absolutely going to read it because I know that it's good. I know this person's a competitor. I want to stay abreast of it. And then if I discuss it, we track that discussion, and then we've got something we can use. I'll give you a repost. Sorry. It still leaves out a certain uh, quantity of, you know, not every, every paper is going to be immediately reviewed. And, and also, if it's something from my competitor, odds are I'm not going to go publicly post the, the answer to his question of where he's wrong because I can publish the next paper that does that. I mean, that's... Well, what if that is well, I mean, that's, you know, they'll, well, then he sees the next step. I mean, that's, the, that was a comment at a meeting recently from a scientist was that, you know, post-publication peer review is called science. You, you, don't, you don't go online and you don't talk about it. You do the next experiment and you publish it. Okay. Uh, yep, first I think Ken. Yeah, I think there's two things going on with peer review. So if you really are peer the way you described it now, and I've done this for a living, I mean, you don't need the peer review, really, because you are the peer review. I'm the, I'm the ultimate peer reviewer, even though my field even if they're giving up the talk before they published it. And, and when you sit down, you want that paper as quickly as possible so you can really look at the details you didn't get from the media. So that's one level. And peer review seems to me, the way it is today, more helps people who not really aren't experts in that particular field. Give them a little more sense of confidence as to what to read. So. Yeah, I think it's like the designation function. And I don't know if that's what you meant by certification um, in your talk, but it's the idea of ranking yeah, um, the literature on a scale. Really yeah, well, that's that was you know the, uh, that was another comment from the same scientist. The meeting was I I know my field well enough. You don't have to tell me what's good and what's not. So just we're talking about publishers and who's a publisher. And Jason, you said that you you published a tweet, and I just think that you all of a sudden it became very clear to me you're not the publisher of that tweet. You're the author of that tweet. Twitter is a four hundred million dollar company. Has received all sorts of funding and assumed a lot of risk. Our investors have assumed a lot of risk, so that they can publish at 100% acceptance rate in a certain social way. WordPress, Clay Shirky's completely wrong, and he was being my point when he said it's not. It's just a button. Well, I hate to tell you, but WordPress was 10 years of, of work and funding and all of this, and they're the publisher, essentially. We're the authors of the Star Page, and we're the publishers of the Star Page. They just have a hundred percent exception to the model that makes it so we can publish it. So I just wanted to make see what you thought about that. And it all of a sudden became much clearer to me that you were actually speaking as an author, not as a publisher. Yeah, great. Great point. I, I totally agree. So the publisher is the person who makes it public, and I'm I'm the author. I, I would disagree with you only in, in the extent that um, I, I, it's not even worth disagreeing. I, I think you're totally right, and I think the important thing... No, no, I, 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 it's, it's a nice point. I, 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 I guess my point is one could argue that WordPress was mostly made on open source countries and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter. The point is someone else is publishing it. The, the point is someone else is publishing it. I totally agree. When I say it's a button, what I mean is it's free to me. And, and it's free to the scholar who says, you know, I just read an interesting article, and I want to tell the world what I think about it, or I just read a wrong article, and I want to tell my colleague what I think about it. And instead of that conversation freeing away into the ether, I'm going to do it on a platform that's free to me, that's a button to me. And then the publication is frictionless, is maybe a better way of looking at it. 
I think it's you know it's something that came up in one of the sessions this morning though is who owns that button, and if you're an academic publisher who is part of academia, uh, owned by a research institute or research society, you have the same interest as the author. You're talking about disseminating information, increasing knowledge. If you're Twitter, if you're Google, your goal is to sell ads. And you know we talked about it in the discovery session earlier. You know Google founded itself on providing the best, most accurate answer to your search question, and now it's that answer. But more importantly, let's promote Google Plus. And, and in some ways, you know they just crossed a line. They're now doing paid inclusion uh, in results, which is what they said it was evil and they would never do. Um, we need to think about who owns that button, and let's keep that button owned by the scholarly community by scholarly publishers, by the academic community itself, because we need to watch out for our own interests and take care of what we need rather than uh, putting all our eggs into the basket of someone else who just sees that as a way to sell iPads or Kindles or advertisements. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. We need to own that. I, I couldn't agree more that as scholars we need to own that button. I, I could disagree with you a little bit when I say, uh, when you say we, the scholarly community, I would not necessarily uh, include, let's say, uh, you know, I don't want to say Elsevier because Elsevier is here, but I, I, I but I will. I, 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 well, here's here's what I'd say. I would say a large multinational corporation is awesome, and my hats off to the same way my hats off to Google. They're making money and they're making the world a better place, and that's important. But I would not say that's us, the scholarly community. And I think in some ways there's a drive that publication should be owned more by us, the scholarly community. That society publishers should do things like there's a lot of interest in a notum, right? Like the sort of WordPress based publishing that's lightweight, it's easier for sort of non experts to use. I think that there's some value in that. We got a question at the back there and then a question here. Will, will you run the back? No, okay, right. So one there. No, I, I won't tell you where I work, but I'll tell you that some of the most rented publishers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I was curious to hear uh, you say that uh, the YouTube community has a better sense of. Um, Some of what? Um, so a guy doing research in China who doesn't have access to the internet or half of the activity, um, any of the feedback, a lot of the social networking sites, or a guy in hospital in India who uh, has very limited Mondays who may not be able to afford to even, uh, even, even know where to go, or somebody who's not publishing in an English language who may want to get some of their money, but well, I'd, I'd certainly agree. I'm talking about a person that has the web. I think that's going to be a fundamental communication technology for the 21st century. I don't think I'm much of a crank in saying that. Um, the good thing about the web is it's available on mobile devices in a lot of places that you would think of as being impoverished to the point where they wouldn't have it. Um, web, you know, I mean, it's well known, right? Like mobile device penetration is really high in places like Africa and stuff like that. So I think assuming that people have the web is a smart assumption in a lot of ways. Um, assuming that people have lots of funding and mentors or something is certainly not anything that would be required by an ecosystem that was built around decoupled publishing. I mean, if I'm an author and I want to publish and I'm good at it and I... I I have good things to say, right, in which we would assume, we would hope, that people are publishing or doing, then uh, I don't think it's particularly difficult for me to, uh, to install WordPress or to find a, a hosted WordPress install and say what I want to say. I mean, in the same way, I mean, granted, that's, that's a skill, but it's the kind of skill you can learn in about 10 minutes, you know? I don't think that's specific to U.S. institutions by any means. If anything, the system that we have right now, where you have to sort of navigate this relatively complicated channel and you have to have access to toll, act, you know, to toll access publications, is, uh, is somewhat weighted, I think, more heavily in favor of more heavily funded and developed countries. <laughs> that is clear to me is why as the publishing community you're laying claim to peer review as a good that you supply. It seems to me that peer review is really supplied by the scientific community 
um, who are getting paid by their home institution or their, or their industry or their company or whatever, not by the, by the publisher. It's the, it's the scholarly community that are the experts in that are doing the well, it's, it's a combination of things because that process has to be managed and it's an incredibly time consuming, tedious process. And as I said, if I, you know, if I send my paper out and ask my best buddies to review it, that doesn't mean a lot. But if I can send it to a neutral third party who can find the, the world's top experts on that subject, then that's a valuable service. And it is, it is, you know, it is performed by the community itself, but it is managed by, uh, by the publishers at this point. And, you know, it's, as, as Jason said, it's, you know, it's, it's part of, you know, it's part of that package of services that are all bundled together under the name publishers. Potentially you could split that out as a, as a separate service on its own. As a publisher, I think that we all do ourselves a disservice when we use the shorthand of peer review, what we're about. It's very important, but I think there's not enough discussion about the fact that peer review is something that is an input into the editorial and publishing process. And um, with, when you kind of skip over that part, it's easy to say, well, why should we pay you to manage the peer review and somebody else? But peer review in many journals does not make editorial decisions. They provide input to the editors to make decisions. And then that article can look very different in its published form from what is submitted. So I think publishers make a big mistake when they 